Thank you, brother, for being here. All right. Thank you for having me. Good morning, everybody. Did you sleep well last night? Kinda? Kinda? A groan? <laughs> well, right now I just wanted to introduce myself. Like I said, my name is Bill Cliff. I'm from the Philly area, but I currently live um, with my wife Melody and little guy Griffin in the city of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, Melody and I just celebrated our fifth anniversary a couple days ago, and Griffin just turned two. So. <coughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, and we're also looking forward to a new baby arriving in early December, so very excited about that. So Melody may not have told everybody that already, so there you go. Um, I work at a church as the assistant pastor. It's called Upper Octorera Presbyterian Church. It's with the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, and so I've been there for about four and a half years at this point. A couple other things about me. I like to sit down. I like to eat food, as we uh, all probably like to do. My um, connection with Shehi is my wife Melody, of course. She's been coming to Shehi as a, with faculty since 2008. Is that correct? Since 2008. And so I'm excited to be here this week. And I'm especially excited about getting to teach God's Word with you this week. I love teaching the Bible, and I love the letter, Paul's letter to the Colossians. So I can't wait to get started with you this week. Um, you'll probably find me after chapel, wandering around the campus with Griffin, pushing him in his little red truck. So if you ever want to stop by and say hi or talk, I'm always available. So Colossians. Oh yeah, I had a picture of Melody and I. Let's see. Can say, aw, aw. Okay, Colossians. <laughs> um, I want to give you a little bit of background on Colossians. Um, what do we need to know about the book? Today I'm going to give you this background. I won't be doing it every day, so I'm going to take a couple, jot down some notes about it. First, the Apostle Paul is the writer of Colossians. This is the same guy you can read all about in the book of Acts who persecuted the church as a Pharisee before encountering Jesus on the road to Damascus. Before Jesus, Paul, actually known as Saul at that time, his biggest passion was mocking and arresting Christ followers. But all that changed when he met Jesus. Saul underwent a radical change of mind and behavior. He became a sold-out follower of Jesus and a missionary for the rest of his life with the goal of spreading the gospel all around the known world. And so our theme for this morning is that we're rooted in that reality. Rooted is the word that I'm looking at this week. We're rooted in the reality that Christ is Lord over all creation. He has secured redemption from us, um, in the past, he's working in our lives in the present, and he's going to be working with us in the future um, to bring us to the new heavens and new earth. And because of these things, he is worth, and we, are, we should give him first place in all things, in the midst of a world that competes for both our attention and our allegiance all around us. So the Colossian church was started during the time of Paul's three-year ministry in Ephesus. That's where Paul wrote the letter to Ephesians. In that time frame, a Colossian named Epaphras was most likely traveling to Ephesus, and he heard Paul speaking, and he responded to Paul's proclamation of the gospel. Epaphras then returned to his hometown and began sharing the good news about Jesus, which resulted in the birth of the Colossian church. At the time when Colossians was written, Epaphras is with Paul in Rome and had likely shared some good news about the gospel taking root, but also that there was the bad news of a dangerous teaching that was threatening the church in Colossae. Paul writes a letter to respond to this dangerous situation and encourage the believers to grow, continue growing and rooting themselves in the gospel so they would be able to stand firm in the midst of that false teaching. So what was that false teaching? Paul received updates from about the church from Epaphras. Epaphras informed Paul about the Colossians' faith and for the love that they had for all the, all the saints. And that was very good news. But there was also some bad news, like I mentioned. The false teachers that were, were coming in and promoting errors about the person of Jesus Christ. Without getting into all the details, the errors added rules to the Christian faith while also questioning Jesus' deity. And these errors opened the door for confusion about the gospel, the church, and the Christian life. And these errors infiltrated the church with the idea that Jesus was not enough. So to combat this, Paul's intention with writing Colossians was to make 
Christ's supremacy the critical factor in the Christian life. Have you ever heard that the best offense is a good defense? Anybody ever hear that before? Well, in this letter, I'm going to flip it around. In Paul's letter, the best defense is a good offense. In other words, Paul wanted the church to have such a high and magnificent view of Jesus that any imitation would pale in comparison to the real thing. So for us today, using Paul's letter to the Colossians during chapel this week, I want to show you such a high and such a magnificent view of Jesus, such as who he is, what he's done, how that affects you right now, and what it means for your future, that every other competing worldview that's surrounding you and affecting you, or an imitation, pales in comparison to the real thing. Does that sound good? All right, let's dig in. Let's dig in. Okay, we're going to be looking this week at Colossians chapter, this, today, at Colossians 1, starting in verse 9. You can turn there in your Bibles. I'm also going to have it up on the screen. Um, I'll be reading from the ESV version. If you can hold that open, I have a question for you right after you find it. Do you ever feel like our world offers a bunch of things that compete for your attention and loyalty? Do you ever feel like this world offers a bunch of things that compete for our attention and our loyalty? Like, it doesn't take long. I mean, I'm thinking personally, my possessions, my abilities, these are all things that compete for my attention. It seems like everybody and everything needs attention. So keep that in the back of your minds. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at Paul's prayer for the Colossian people and his desire to see them firmly rooted in spiritual understanding along with a walk, a walk that's worthy of the Lord. Let's remember here that Epaphras has communicated to Paul the good things that are happening, but also some of the dangerous teachings that are coming as well. So Paul doesn't want to see his Colossian friends led down a path that's dangerous, especially in the midst of all the progress that they've been making. Let me read for you verse 9. <clears throat> and so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. From the day that we heard about the Colossian spiritual progress, that is Paul and Timothy, um, they, they had heard about the faith and their love for all the saints. Watching the gospel take root and produce fruit was thrilling for Paul. Spiritual fruit is always the goal. And that's why the counselors and this whole camp set up to talk about music is here, because we want to see you progress as musicians, but also be rooted in the gospel, to be able to stand up any, under the, any of the pressures that the world throws our way. It also says, We have not stopped praying for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Prayer. Prayer would be so important to the growth of these young Christians and this young church. God has chosen to use prayer as a powerful tool for us in this lifetime. So, have you ever thought about what I should be praying for our friends about? What could I be praying for my friends about? Well, right here it's telling us knowledge about God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Of course, we need to make it personal and make it personal for our friends, but we need spiritual understanding. You need it as young people, you'll need it as adults, you'll need it as musicians. So what is spiritual wisdom and understanding? To look at that, I want to look at the word wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to discern or judge what, it is, what is true, right, or lasting. Or to put it a simpler way, wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge to real life. It's more than just gathering and accumulating knowledge. It's more than that. It's a God-given ability that allows us to wisely apply the knowledge we have in the correct situation, in the correct, correct way, at the correct time. Knowing that the false teachers were infiltrating the church, Paul wanted the Colossian people to have knowledge and wisdom so they could discern what was actually true. If people just had that kind of wisdom, it wouldn't matter what kind of exaggeration of the truth and outright lies were told. They'd be able to spot the lie. It's the same way for us. No matter what worldviews and what challenges are sent our way to, to combat or to go against our worldview about Jesus, we'd be able to stand strong because we'd be able to stand, spot the lie because we have the spiritual wisdom and insight. 
So worldviews that affect us all around us. So what are some of these competing worldviews that we see? Well, as I've been researching and looking at someone, there's so many worldviews that come up against us. Um, I looked up the Barna Research Institute. That's just a group of researchers that studies the Christian faith and what some of the challenges to the Christian faith are in terms of other worldviews competing. And a couple of them that I saw stand out is a new spirituality and a secularism. A new spirituality first. This is the whole idea, and this really, this really has infected the church in North America very strongly. It's the whole idea that religion and spirituality, these are good things. It's a good thing to talk about God and Jesus and all these things, but there are multiple ways to reach God. There are multiple ways. It's not just Jesus. So that leaves us with something. Jesus plus something else. So in their, in their case, Jesus is not enough. And that's a new spirituality. Then there's the secularism. That's the idea that there is no God. If there was a God, the God would be science. Um, humans, humans decide what's right and wrong. In that, in that formula, there's no Jesus. No Jesus equals finding the truth. And then underneath those two, I see another one that seems to infect Christians a lot, and that's the idea of materialism. Materialism. And that would go into, really, a secular view of life. And that's that stuff equals real meaning and fulfillment. And that's, once again, adding something to Jesus. And when we do that, that's not truly what the gospel is talking about. So worldviews. As followers of Christ in the year 2018, we need, we need the ability to dis discern what is true and what is right. In the midst of so many worldviews competing for our attention and so many things wanting our time, we need to be able to discern what's true and what's right. We need the ability to look at something and say, yes, that lines up with my biblical worldview, or no, that contradicts my biblical worldview. We need a worldview filter that we're able to look at everything with. So, because of that spiritual wisdom and understanding that Paul wants for the Colossians and wants for us, we're going to be looking at verse 10, and it's going to start talking about our walk, our walk that's a result of that spiritual wisdom and understanding. I'll be reading from verse 10. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So Colossians gives us a snapshot of three ways that we should walk. If we have that spiritual wisdom and understanding, if we have that foundation of that spiritual foundation, there are, this is a snapshot of three, three ways that we should be walking. First, Paul says that the Colossian people, we should be walking and by bearing fruit, bearing fruit in every good work. So what is bearing spiritual fruit? In Galatians 5, we see, we see the fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to read verse 22 and 23. In that verse, Paul tells us, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. And increasing in the knowledge of God. And where do we find knowledge about God? We find knowledge about God where? From his word. We're rooted because of God's word, the Bible. I love the connection here. Of course, of course, having knowledge of God without bearing fruit is a major problem, right? If we just have a lot of head knowledge and don't do anything with that information, we're missing the boat somewhere there. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need both an increase in knowledge of God and the spiritual fruit. We don't just go, we don't just live the, we just don't walk the walk without knowing what God tells us in his word. God's word to us is so vital to that whole idea of bearing spiritual fruit. We need to be connected to his word. So how do we do this? We bear fruit, we can be connected to his word by asking God for his help to guide us in the truth of his word and ask us to empower us by the strength of his Holy Spirit to live that word out. 
And that's partly why, that's mostly why we say spending time in God's Word is so important. That's why we do devotions. That's why we spend time in worship by studying His Word at church. We do it because God's Word is the primary way that we grow and we're strengthened. And it's also, subsequently, the primary way that we're able to spot um, unhealthy and um, imitation worldviews that are out there against Jesus. So bearing fruit in every good work. Next, being strengthened. Being strengthened with all power. This is also extremely important. Our empowerment, the power that we have, isn't a human decision or an act of the will. It all comes from God for the purpose of having patience and endurance. You can't do it by your own strength. We need spiritual strength to live out the gospel. As we, read his ver as we read his word and we're filled with the knowledge and understanding that we have there, we cannot do it on our own. We need God's power through his Holy Spirit to give us the strength to live it out. So this morning, have you ever tried to live but for God by your own strength? Have you ever tried to live for God by your own strength? I think if we're honest, we all have. We try, we have this idea, we're going to be more consistent in our devotions. We're going to overcome some sinful habit this week. We're going to make it happen. We're going to love someone who's difficult to love. The list goes on and on. You can fill in the blank there. When we're doing, when we're doing these things by our own strength and by our own willpower, our attempts are going to be fruitless. They're going to be fruitless unless we access God's strength. We access his strength through the power of the Holy Spirit. We need Jesus for every step of the way. We need him for the good days and we need him in the tough days when we especially need that strength. We need him in the power of his Holy Spirit. So we need to be growing in his knowledge and wisdom so that we're able to discern the right way to go. Which leads me to the next bit of information Paul wanted us to know. He told us that we need to be believers who are giving thanks to the Father. The undeserved love and grace that we receive from God through Jesus should be more than enough to trigger thankfulness in our lives. If you don't feel thankful now, let's start praying to God that he would bring these things to mind that we should be thankful for and those areas of transformation that he's already given us in our lives that would not be possible without him. But Paul gives us right here three reasons for giving thanks. Three reasons for giving thanks. First he says, we should give thanks to the Father because he has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. In other words, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, when you become a follower, he has now, he, he has saved you in the present. He saved you in the present, but he is also looking forward to the future when we will be with him in the new heavens and the new earth. And this is an awesome reality of the future that we have. Um, at the end, when we are together in new heavens and new earth, where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, and we are fully able to communicate and live with each other and in the, before Jesus. And what an amazing time that will be. And we give thanks because we know that that is our future reality. Next, we give thanks because he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. We were once walking in darkness, but we are now walking in light because of what he did. Jesus came on a rescue mission sent by the Father to save us when we could not save ourselves. We were so engrossed in our sin problem that we were unable to do what was required to pay for that sin problem. So God, in his infinite wisdom, sent Jesus to this world 2,000 years ago to live, to die, and to rise again so that we might have life. He sent, us, he sent his son in a rescue operation to do what we were unable to do, to rescue us from darkness. I'm going to look up 1 John 1.5. 1 John 1.5 talks about the darkness and the light. Um, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. We were once stuck in darkness, but God, through Jesus, has rescued us. And my third point, he has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, who is allowing us to walk in the light. He came on this rescue operation to rescue us for a new purpose, and that is to walk for him, fully equipped in every good thing that we need to walk in the light and be his representatives in a dark world. 
All to say, Christ followers, we should be the most thankful people around. We know the depth of our sin, yet we also know that God loves us in spite of that and wants to use us and to be with us. So as we land a plane for this first message this morning, I want to ask you a couple of questions. So thinking back, do you think that you're growing in spiritual wisdom and understanding? Why or why not? If you are, are you walking in the truth that you already know? Are you bearing fruit? Are you bearing fruit in the last six months? Do you see your faith being strengthened? Are you standing up are you standing up and walking in this world stronger than you were six months ago? How about your thankfulness? How have you been doing in thankfulness? We should be the most thankful people, but sometimes it's really tough. Sometimes it's really tough at 8.20 in the morning to get up and be thankful, but we're called to do it. So as you leave this place today, I would, I would ask and pray that you think about these things. Think about these things this morning as Paul, through Colossians, is calling us to live rooted in this world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time that we got to spend together this morning um, worshiping you and looking to your word to hear what you had to say to us, Lord. We want to be people that are rooted in your word, people that are so strongly connected to you that any, any posers or imposters would be easy for us to spot knowing that you are the real thing, Lord. We just pray that we would grow closer to you during this time we have and also that we would um, be strengthened as we walk in your word on a daily basis, Lord. Be with us, Lord. We thank you for what you've done for us. In your name, amen.